Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, wherever in the world you may be joining us from today. My name is Francesco Del Carpio, and I'm the CFAL York Operations Coordinator. I would like to officially open the first session of the Emergency Management and Hospitals and Healthcare Speaker Series with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge and recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territory upon which our campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. The area is known as Tokoronto and has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and the territory is subject to the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. As this is an online event, our participants may be joining from various locations, so I strongly encourage you to learn about the traditional land upon which you are located. With this, I welcome our moderator, our speaker, and our participants from around the world. Welcome to our webinar. For those who may not be familiar with CFAL York, our center was established in 2020 and started its operations in 2021. CFAL York was created in collaboration between the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, UNITAR, and York University with York Region to develop and deliver training and knowledge sharing, as well as capacity building programs across five focus areas, which are disaster risk, emergency management and humanitarian actions, health development, environment and climate change, entrepreneurship, digital technology and economic development, equity, diversity and inclusion, and advancing the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Misha Richard. Misha Richard is the current emergency preparedness lead for the Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Center in Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada. In this role, she acts as a subject matter expert assisting with the development and maintenance of emergency management governance, training materials, and exercises. Misha also volunteers as an editor for the Canadian Journal of Emergency Management and is happy to be a collaborator and facilitator for this CFAL York series. She holds a Master of Disaster and Emergency Management degree from York University and a bachelor's degree Oh, sorry, and bachelor degrees from Western University and Brandon University in the focus areas of political science and disaster studies. Misha, thank you very much for moderating today's session and for all the work you've done for this series so far. Um, welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'm excited to be here. And I guess, as was mentioned, this is our inaugural session. So I'm excited to be able to introduce our first speaker in this series. Um, very gratefully was willing to be in the hot seat today um, and share all of her knowledge with us. So I do have Cassandra Stockman, um, and she's the Emergency Preparedness Advisor at Halton Healthcare. So it's an organization comprised of three community hospitals, numerous community-based services located in the growing communities of Halton Hills, Milton, and Oakville. And I know she'll give you a little bit of an overview of that in her presentation. She's worked in the field of emergency management since first beginning her career at the Office of Public Safety and Emergency Management at the George Washington University in Washington, DC. And upon her return to Canada in 2008, she held progressive roles in organizations of higher education and regional government. As she continued to develop her skills and knowledge in emergency management, her focus changed to the area of health emergency preparedness. And in 2013, Cassandra joined Halton Healthcare during an exciting time of change for the organization. She was directly involved in emergency management planning related to the completion of three major capital redevelopment projects, including the construction of a 1.6 million square foot hospital in Oakville and significant expansion at Milton District Hospital that effectively tripled the size of that hospital. So again, I know she'll give you a little bit of a visual um, of that in the presentation. So Cassandra is passionate about fire uh, safety and is a dedicated advocate of both personal and work preparedness. She has a master's of forensic science from George Washington University and is a DRI international certified business continuity professional. So just to plug it as well, Cassandra is also now the proud mother of two little toddlers. So very busy and very much appreciate her time. So um, now that I've made the introduction, I'll just quickly comment a couple of housekeeping notes. So obviously we'll have folks muted, um, but you are very much encouraged to ask questions throughout by dropping them in the chat. I will do my best to moderate the chat as we progress. Um, I believe Cassandra has a couple of points in the presentation where we can pause to review some of those questions as well as at the completion of the presentation. So again, please feel free to populate them in there as we go um, and we will address them periodically. So thank you. And with that, Cassandra, the floor is yours.
confirming I can see the appropriate display screen. Thank you. I believe you're still muted, however. There we go. <laughs> okay, thank you, everyone. Okay, so I'm here to talk to you about the application of the Provincial Incident Management System here in Ontario at um, Halton Healthcare specifically, um, but our application process obviously could work for other hospitals. So what we're going to talk about first is I am going to give you an overview of Halton Healthcare, the emergency codes, and the Ontario IMS uh, system. I'm going to talk about how we introduced IMS here at Halton Healthcare, what the differences are from the provincial IMS um, at our sites, and as well as us using this IMS in action. So first, who is Halton Healthcare? So as a uh, Ms. already um, told you about, we've got three hospitals. So we have Oakville Trafalgar Memorial Hospital, Milton District Hospital, Georgetown Hospital, all in Halton region, um, which is just to the, uh, so Toronto helps out, Peel's kind of between us and Toronto. Uh, so Mississauga is kind of our, Mississauga Brampton are our big borders. And here is a little map of how we work. Our Oakville and Milton sites are actually quite close together now. Um, after we built the new Oakville Hospital. Um, Georgetown Hospital is up in um, more the rural area of Halton Hills. And then we have um, several community services and we've just listed a few on here, but we do actually have a dialysis center in Burlington. We are sort of the main dialysis group for Halton region. Um, so we support the Burlington um, group as well. Uh, Joseph Grant Memorial Hospital doesn't do that portion for us. So we do the dialysis. And I do cover all the three hospitals plus all these community services for emergency management. So the capital projects that we just mentioned quickly um, that uh, kind of play a role in some of this uh, work for the IMS. Georgetown, um, just after I uh, joined, uh, did open a uh, ED and a brand new eMERGE department and expanded their DI to include a CT scanner. Um, and then the DI department, uh, the diagnostic imaging, sorry, was uh, fully renovated. Um, IMS wasn't fully used in this response as I had just started, but within one week of that opening, the eMERGE department completely flooded out uh, due to a construction error, So, um, which I can talk a little bit about after as well. Oakville in 2015 uh, was a 1.6 million square foot uh, new build. So it was a complete move from the old site in South Oakville to this new site in North Oakville. Um, and uh, this is where I had a little bit more involvement. And then in Milton in 2017, I really got involved in the planning and design of this site. Um, and we fully expanded. So really what we did was we added a huge section onto the old Milton Hospital, um, made in it, making it quite a bit larger and much needed space uh, for the units. What are Halton Healthcare's emergency codes? Now, I do know we have people um, that have joined this that probably don't work in the hospital system. Um, and this is really important to understand uh, for what we do here. So here at Halton Healthcare, these are our codes. Uh, so we have a code red for fire, code yellow for missing patients, code blue is your cardiac arrests. Um, we have a few unique ones here, which is Teal Medical, Lockdown Home Secure and Omega. Um, so those aren't some of the standard ones. Uh, so Teal would be acute inpatient stroke. Medical is first aid response needed in non-clinical areas, so public spaces or externally. Lockdown, home secure, so same definitions that are used with the school system, so uh, active shooter events, um, or if we need to lock our doors and uh, keep ourselves safe inside, um, that's our holding secures. And then a code omega is a massive blood transfusion. Uh, so when I talk a little bit about our IMS, we will focus a bit on some of the larger scale events or code grays, code oranges. Um, this is where we really break out into a full IMS uh, system. So for those of you who aren't from Ontario, uh, just a quick understanding of what we have. So IMS as should be is a standardized approach to emergency management and it provides the model on how personnel, equipment, everything should be coordinated and work within one structure. It is based on the understanding that we use functions. It's not people, it's the functions that need to be completed regardless of the size of the event. 
So you always have your command, your operations, planning, logistics, finance, and administration. And it is used for simple. So this is the single house fires, the water main breaks. Here it could be our um, basic code blue, uh, which is a, a cardiac arrest for one patient. Um, or you could have your complex. So this is the ones that go for long. So this could be a major flood. This is what is we've all just experienced with COVID. Um, is the more complex events that last long and revolve a lot more levels of uh, government or uh, within your organization departments and um, senior senior leaders. When can you use it? Here, we use it for everything. So the examples that the province provides is the communicable disease outbreaks, the hazardous materials incidents, infrastructure failures, planned events. Um, we've used it for all codes, plus we have used it for planned events here as well. So to understand just how ours looks, this is the org chart that is used at Halton Healthcare. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about it as we expand, but it looks very similar to what you'll see in the province. Um, if you take the their courses, the 250, which is the EOC course, has this policy group. Um, and you can see there, that's where our senior leadership sits, um, which for some hospitals can be very different. Our senior leaders do not work within our EOC beyond the incident commander role. So how does it really work for everything? So if nobody's ever seen this, this is my party IMS that I use to teach IMS to all my uh, managers and directors and senior leaders here. Um, it just gives them a quick overview to really understand that th they've used it. They may not have realized it, but they have used IMS. If they have at any time uh, organized a party, hosted a party, they have done IMS. So here, your command is your host. Your emergency information officer is the person doing your invitations, your thank yous. Uh, if you have a pool party, your safety officer is your lifeguard. Your operations, you run the actual party. They're cooking, they're serving the food, they're decorating. Planning, they made a party plan, they made a rain plan, they booked the venue, the, they got or they planned the menu, they did the menu pl planning, they did the guest list, logistics ordered everything. They got they ordered the food, they uh, secured the venue, they ordered those decorations. And then finance admin is you the ones that are paying for everything, and they're also the ones that receive those gifts or those donations. So before I move on, does anybody have any questions just sort of on the basics of what Halton Healthcare is, codes, and that IMS overview? So I'll just pause for one minute and see if anything gets populated in the chat. I keep saying the chat and I have to apologize, but we are talking about the Q&A. Um, thank you, Ali, for clarifying that is where we'd like you to put your questions um, versus the chat, which has been disabled. So I am seeing one coming up. Uh, although, okay, so somebody is giving kudos to you, Cassandra, already that that's the best IMS overview they've ever seen. <laughs> I do love your, I do love your party overview. Very, very helpful. Um, somebody is asking if we'll be able to review this presentation or have access to some of this information um, for your own note taking. Um, I'll leave Ali or Francesco to answer that one, but I believe that yes, like these sessions are recorded, so attendees should be able to get access later. Um, but stay tuned for um, that answer because I can see Francesco's typing. Um, just another comment also, Cassandra, somebody else noting that the party overview is very relatable way to understand the chart. So giving thanks for that. But there weren't any other questions that popped up that were asking for further detail regarding IMS or Holton Healthcare in general. So I think we're safe for you to continue on. Okay. And I will provide my contact information at the end. So if anybody wants to follow up further on any of the slides, any training documents that we do use, there um, feel free to con uh, contact me. I'm more than happy to share stuff. So introducing it to Halton Healthcare. So when I first started in 2013, Halton Healthcare was using the Ontario Hospital Association's Hospital Incident Command System, or we call it HICS. Um, it's, it's not com completely different, but it does use some different terminology. However, we ended up switching to the Ontario version because that's what all our partners in Halton Region were using. So paramedics, police, fire, they all use the provincial IMS. Halton Region was familiar with the terms. The municipalities were all beginning to sort of switch over to it. Um, so it made more sense for us to use the same terminology, which really is what IMS is all about. Um, 
so it did help us to uh, really show, let, let's switch, let's call it not the command center, let's call it the emergency operations center because that's what these teams are gonna call and ask for because that's what they're used to, um, that's what they've been trained on. So, oh, sorry about that. Okay, uh, so as we started uh, moved over into this, one of the things I started to do was add the term incident commander into all our emergency codes and plans. So it was at least would people understand somebody needs to be in charge when this is happening. Um, Cause that's always, I'm sure those that work in the hospitals have seen this, You everybody runs to the scene and then everybody sort of stands there because somebody's not stepping into the room <laughs> to run the event. Uh, here we really uh, push that there's an incident commander. Who is it? Um, sometimes it's listed as it is the, the first hospital staff member on scene becomes the incident commander. And then it might even note that it is transferred to uh, the leader on call or uh, CO should they once they arrive at the scene. Um, and then the other positions get uh, they're used more as we progress up, especially into our EOC. So as the event gets bigger, we start expanding it out. So you probably aren't going to see anything about the liaison officer listed in the code blue. Okay, but the code blue will clearly outline that there is an incident commander. Okay, so all staff at least learn that basic term. For us, our emergency operation centers are, they are, of course, just like they should be for everywhere, responsible for business continuity. That is the key role of an EOC. Um, ours are structured into the IMS format, and it can only be, they can only be activated by our uh, COO or our senior administrator on call. Um, and we have three structures that can be set up. So this is taken from the Ontario IMS. Um, so we do follow it. So we have an EOC command. So this is where we are providing incident support to the area. Not as common in the hospital. Um, we're more likely to do incident command where we're actually running the incident. Uh, we're running that incident from the EOC. So if you want to think of it, the EOC is the incident command post. Uh, the area command, this is when we have multiple sites with IMS in each. Uh, not quite as common. It looked at, we sort of did a bit of this for COVID. So you had a team kind of per hospital that was kind of running this. Then we had a corporate one. Um, but because COVID ended up being drawn out, we didn't, we kind of took those smaller ones out of the, out. Um, we didn't really need them anymore. Just as things were, it was just a progress. Which is a slow progression that just kept going on and on and on for three years. Uh, so, but you could see this happening for uh, Code Orange, uh, which is a mass casualty event uh, where it's impacting more than one of our hospitals. So we may have an IMS EOC set up at each site, and then we have a corporate one that's they're reporting into. So just back to understanding, here is our org chart that we do use. We do not have designated roles in here um, beyond a couple, which I will explain soon. Um, but what it is, is our command structure is there. That is our incident commander who has then the EOC scribe, the emergency information officer, the liaison officer, and the safety officer. Then we have our operations section, which are our doers, planning section, which are our thinkers, logistics section, which are our getters, and finance admin section, which are our payers. When any of the people come into the EOC, we do have little handouts for them. So if they have, for some reason, not gone through the IMS training, which does happen occasionally with new staff, they have a little document that they're able to pull out and read and understand what the IMS is. And usually they have no issues stepping into the role and uh, doing what they need to do. And this obviously is one of the first things that they see is this org chart. Um, and these org charts are actually posted in all our EOCs so we can fill in who is in each role. So they're like white whiteboard uh, charts. So full support for IMS be, really began though in healthcare with a bowl of planning. So what happened was um, my senior vice president was, it was suggested to her from my vice president that they speak to me because she was having trouble getting anything done because they were having 40 plus people on a conference call that was taken over an hour to make decisions. So you can understand how well this is going when you have 40 people trying to decide something. So I suggested, well, let's use IMS and we can focus the work a little bit more. So I gave her a chart, told her here's who should be in the room. We gave it a try. We dropped it down to nine staff and our meetings were being done in about 15 minutes. 
So the big thing too that came out of this was some of the staff were no longer being so overwhelmed. So our poor um, manager of, of uh, infection prevention and control was drowning with the Ebola planning. She was doing everything. She was getting all the ministry guidelines, trying to figure out how we should use them here and then going out and trying to implement them. She just could not do, she was literally not sleeping for this time period. So when we switched to here, she became the planning, um, actually I'll move to the, sorry, next slide. So here's the org chart. So this is her here. She became the planning section um, chief and her focus then was receiving those ministry uh, guidelines and coming up with a plan on how it should work here at Healthcare. She would then pass it on to the operations section who would implement her plan. Okay, so it really, it really put her where she should be focusing and let the people that are out there in the group can do the training. Um, logistics, uh, this really helped too. Um, we were having, you know, one group's ordering this, one group's ordering this, they're all just putting their orders through. So some groups were ending up with more stuff, other groups weren't getting the supplies they were supposed to have. So once we set up a logistics section chief, they would receive all the orders and then properly set up who really needed what to make sure everybody did get something and the groups that needed a bit more did get what they needed. So this uh, really streamlined some of this. Um, obviously finance admin, this is where everything gets paid. So we did have our director there. Um, the difference here that you'll see is our operations section, we, we have it listed as unified. So normally you see unified as your command, um, but here because of our three sites, we do do this with our infectious diseases. Um, is our unified is our three COOs from our hospital. So they get together as an operations section. So they go out and uh, implement at their three sites um, and they work very well together and they'll decide which of them will be the spokesperson for the operations section. Um, and it's it's worked very well. And this is what we did do during COVID. And we had, uh, once again, no, no issues uh, doing it this way. Our incident commander um, at the time was the chief nursing officer, which is the senior vice president. Um, it is a new role. So our, our ICE plan, our infectious control emergencies plan is listed a little bit different now. Um, but as you can see, all the positions are uh, laid out. Um, and this is who came into those meetings was the top group. What's interesting um, and takes a little bit of time at all organizations is to understand that the director of facilities and support services is a good example. So here's the logistics uh, chief and she's got the director of ICT reporting to her and the manager of materials management who actually is shared services West and isn't even a Halton healthcare employee reporting to her. They are only reporting to her for Ebola planning in this situation. For their day-to-day -day work, they have their own bosses. So it takes a little bit of understanding to this, but once people kind of wrap their head around that for this event, this is my boss, but for everything else, my boss is normal. Um, it works really, really well. So just to understand sort of those designated roles or noticeable differences that we do have here at Halton Healthcare. So as you saw in there, our emergency information officer is always our communications and public affairs staff. Okay, so someone from that group is the one that sits in that role. Our incident commander is always a senior leader. So it's our CO or one of our vice presidents um, is always the one that uh, sits into that role. Um, so that's sort of the connection that we maintain to go up to what we call our policy group, which is our um, the rest of senior leadership and where our CEO would be. Um, and that's the one thing. So our incident commander also is never our CEO because the CEO does have something else to do during a an emergency and she should not be in our EOC um, or she can't do both both parts of uh, the job. Uh, commonly what we do see is we may have a shared role between what we call our contracts management group and Ellis Dawn and, or JCI. So these are our maintenance team. So we are P3s here. So our maintenance of our buildings are contracted for 30 years to these groups. So at Oakville, Ellis Dawn is our maintenance department. So if say we have a cold gray flood, they are the operations section chief, but they're going to share it jointly with contracts management who is going to assist them with this just because of the unique um, uh, relationship that we have. Uh, I talked about the oper unified operations section uh, chiefs. Um, and then, like I said, we do have Shared Services West, who is actually a regular EOC member for us and commonly sits in the logistics section. Um, and it's just moved up. We actually no longer have a director of facility support services like that. So 
uh, he is very calmly sitting in this role. So it what's nice is it really shows that it doesn't it doesn't have to be only whole healthcare that sits in our EOC. We do bring out bring in outside um, support into it that is needed, and he, it's great. Actually, probably most people don't even realize he's not held in healthcare staff because um, he is sort of dedicated to our site, but um, it is great. It, and he is the logistics person. He is the supplies person, but he works with the, so it's ICT needs to be in there too. He'll pick an ICT person to report to him. So he re reports on them as well. So doesn't need to know everything. He just needs to know who to bring into his team. So any questions on this from this part? Okay, so we do actually have a couple of questions. Um, one came through a few minutes ago asking about the province did update. So the province of Ontario. So again, keeping in mind that, again, we do have participants from outside of the province of Ontario. You're focusing on Ontario's format. And they did recently update to IMS 2.0. So the question was if you've incorporated any of this IMS 2.0 um, updated material into kind of your training and program or whether that might not be applicable um, to venue like yours? So I haven't at this time, but I will be kind of going through and seeing if I need to. The only reason it hasn't been done yet is, um, which I probably should have told you, is I actually have just returned from my mat leave. So I haven't had time yet to get into that level yet, um, but it is something I will be reviewing and seeing if we do need to make any adjustments. And then I have one more question. So while I ask this question, we'll see if anything else pops through, but um, you did mention the checklist that you have. Um, and the question was, are they specific to each of your codes or are they generic enough to be used during any sort of response? Okay. We actually have both. So we actually have the provincial checklist, and this is why I do need to go and see the new materials and see if any of that has been updated and changed. We do actually have the provincial checklist in there, which are generic and really give a good outline just of what the role or that section chief should be focusing on. So we do leave those in there. Um, and then we have created some job action sheets uh, for our specific codes that are more likely to set up an EOC. So like I said, our code orange, um, our mass casualty events, or our code grays, which is flooding, power outages, ICT outages. So we do have a little bit more, um, some specific pointers for those, but they are meant to be not, you must do this, but uh, things that you should think about. Uh, so it might not apply to the event, but we do give them just some ideas of things they might want to think about. And something like a uh, good example of what we added there was code gray flood uh, photographs for insurance purposes. Wasn't and obviously we've learned off of this. Uh, so things like that have been um, added in. So they're not necessarily maybe it's not relevant for that event, but it is there just to think, oh, maybe we should somebody should go down and have a take some pictures. So that's that's sort of what our job action sheets really more focus on for the specific codes. OK, so I also have another question. <clears throat> OK, <laughs> me as I lose my voice. Um, Asking, how large is the dedicated emergency management team for Halton Healthcare? <clears throat> is it just you, Cassandra? <laughs> so actually, uh, it was, I actually also did fire safety for all our hospitals and offices. Um, and we just uh, started a fire safety officer position. So fire has been uh, taken out of my portfolio to the extent of the day-to-day -day sort of fire safety, the basic fire drills, things like that. Obviously, the code red plan still falls under my um, committee. So we do have an emergency preparedness committee here, um, as all codes um, have to be finalized through that group. Um, but it is just me otherwise that does all this. Um, so I do like to go out there. So if there's anybody looking for a field placement out there, um, I do take students <laughs> to help with a lot of big projects we have. Excellent little plug. Bug. Um, okay, I think the last question before I let you kind of continue on to the next segment is we do have somebody commenting that, so clearly they're coming from healthcare, they're commenting that their hospital is small, so they were wondering, do you recommend having leadership take on multiple functions and roles? Yes, yeah, so you might have to, and I actually, it might help, I'm going to show a planning event where we actually did have people doing multiple functions, so it might help um, 
And if you have further questions after that, let me know, but this might help uh, see how it could work at uh, the smaller groups if needed. Excellent. And that's all the questions I see. So I think you're safe to continue. Perfect. Okay. So I'm actually going to talk about two events that we had to, uh, I mean, we've used IMS multiple times. We've had multiple EOC setups. Um, uh, if anybody has never kind of opened a new site, when we first opened Oakville Hospital, well, I told you Georgetown Hospital within one week, uh, the emergency department flooded due to the wrong rating on the sprinkler head in the mechanical room, which was above the emergency department, so it burst. Um, and then um, even then the new generator also uh, shut down on us. Um, so we've had a few experiences this. Oakville flooded like crazy uh, after we opened. Um, and then Milton Hospital did pretty good, but they did have a bunch of uh, sort of backups uh, in the uh, drainage systems. Um, so we had to experience some of that. They never flooded quite to the extent of Oakville did though. So um, I'm not gonna talk about our first major flood. We call it the family day flood that happened on family day weekend. And it all the heating coils burst down the hallway of nuclear medicine. Um, and the good thing was is that all the camera equipment was up off the floor. So we didn't lose anything. <laughs> but on July, 2017, here at Oakville Hospital, we unfortunately had a bad event in our uh, basement where contractors got hit with steam um, and two of them were badly burned. Um, and we also, and this is, sorry, Ellis Dawn's contractors. Um, and uh, also the Ellis Dawn team was impacted by the event as well, uh, working through this. Um, what happened was a code gray flood got activated uh, as this, obviously the water was pouring out. Um, and it wasn't activated by the Elliston team, though someone else activated it, which was unfortunate because they didn't want to activate anything because um, they didn't want to bring people down to this. Um, and then somebody called the code medical because unfortunately, as you can guess, uh, there was a lot of noise um, as this was occurring. Um, so our code medical is our first aid support. So um, this was to bring uh, uh, merch nurses at the time down to the area. Um, I then get a phone call from the Olive Down staff saying that uh, we've got this event in the basement. We need to get everybody out. Can we authorize a code green? And I said, you guys have every authority to activate a code green. Um, this is actually when we changed our definition. Um, so none of our codes say health, healthcare staff, they say hospital staff to include our contracted groups of Pallet and our security team and um, Alice Dawn and JCI so that they also have the authority to activate the appropriate codes as required. So at the time it was called a code green stat. So it was an immediate evacuation of the entire level zero. And this was due to the fact that the entire basement had just steamed. So there was, you couldn't see very well in most of the basement and they didn't know what was being aerosolized in the steam. So was there chemical in that was the concern. So they, we did activate the basement. So that meant that we were uh, taking out our pharmacy, our kitchen, and our kitchen is the one that provides food for all three hospitals, um, our ICT group, our medical device reprocessing, our environmental services team. Um, so everybody sort of, uh, and our stores, uh, supplies and everything were downstairs. Oh, sorry, hold on one second. <laughs> And sorry, we have energy savings here at Oakville. So the lights turn off every two hours in your office. So, um, so this was a, a big evacuation. Obviously at this point, um, I, I had been notified just because of the activation of the code green. I then would called what we have as a leader on call. So this was a Saturday morning. Um, so I phoned the leader on call, um, which was a manager of cardio rest at the time uh, that day. Um, she had already been activated because of the code gray flood. So as soon as that got uh, activated, she got called by switchboard. Um, so she had already heard what was happening, was driving in. Um, so I said, you are incident commander right now. What do you want me to do? So she said, I'd like to go to the emer emergency department and see if the emergency, how they're handling this event. Because um, they were getting these uh, patients coming out from the basement. Um, and asked me if I could go work with Ellis Dawn on what needed to be done. And I was also to notify the senior leader. So I called the senior leader, said, okay, we got a big event. We need to activate the EOC. It was, it happened to be my boss at the time who was 45 minutes away. So he called a friend 
and our CEO of Georgetown, um, who also happens to be the co-chair of my committee. So she's very, very uh, well versed in IMS and um, emergency preparedness. She came over right away. She was five minutes away and she activated her EOC and her IMS structure. Um, following this too, we then had to activate a code grade loss of hot water because they had to turn it off to stop the flow in the basement. So we no longer had hot water in the hospital. So she set up her uh, EOC to be this. So her incident, as incident commander, she was, the COO was there. Um, our EOC scribe, this is, so for all of the, you, this is what happens when you show up at the hospital and say, hey, how can I help? Uh, you now become an EOC scribe. Um, she'd never done it before, uh, but we gave her the materials to review. Um, and told her what she was going to be in charge of. She had no issue. She figured it out very quickly. Um, and just because she happened to be one of the first ones on scene, um, as everybody else was responding in, uh, she also went and quickly started getting some food because of the timing of this. It sounds funny, but everybody was going to be missing. Um, I think it was lunch. Everybody was pretty much going to be missing the meal because they were all driving in. So we just went and grabbed some bagels from Tim Hortons quick, just so people had some sustenance when they arrived. Um, I was the liaison officer. Um, as emergency preparedness advisor as well, I'm also what we call the EOC manager. So I just make sure the IMS structure does get set up correctly and I provide the EOC support. So making sure that the section chiefs and stuff have what they need. I make suggestions to them if they need stuff. Um, and I make sure that the supplies and everything are appropriate in the EOC. Uh, our emergency information officer was our director of communications and public affairs. Our safety officer was the manager of occupational health and safety. Um, ops operations section. So this was when we had our unified group, which was our Ellis Dawn, a general manager with our director of uh, redevelopment, um, which is our contract management group. Uh, planning section. So this is where the leader on call sat. Uh, so she was already been involved. So she was the first incident commander. So when the EOC got at, was being activated, she transferred incident command to uh, the CEO and she took on this role. Logistics, we brought in the manager of ICT happened to be here and um, asked if she could. She had no IMS training. She read the documents in the EOC and stepped in the role and she did, <clears throat> sorry, and she did an excellent job. Um, and then finance admin was the director, um, very commonly it's our director of finance. Um, for the planning section, I just broke it out just to show that she is the manager of cardiorespiratory. She didn't know how this was impacting those groups in the basement. So she brought the managers into her team. So they provided updates to her and she was able to help formulate plans that then the operations section knew about and things were being implemented, but they were also doing sort of long-term planning. So what are we gonna do if we are out of this basement for the next four hours, the next eight hours, next, uh, next 24 hours? So these groups were all working together to do this. Um, it, Probably lasted, uh, the, the loss of hot water was actually out for a while, but this EOC was uh, set up for, I'd say we had it fully activated for about 12 hours. And then we were able to just come back sort of uh, for some meetings the next days as um, the groups had returned to the basement and everything kind of had settled that way. And it was just to touch base on the loss of hot water and how we continued that code gray until that was cleared. Um, what we did learn out of this was just on a side note, one well, not related to IMS, but we changed our definition of a code orange from a external disaster to just disaster um, or mass casualty because our emerge department actually should have activated a certain level of code orange, but didn't because the event happened inside. So that was uh, just lesson learned from us um, from here, and that's what we we did change. Now for uh, a planned event, I just wanted to show a little bit of an example how this can work for something else. So we had to do an entire network shutdown to do some critical repairs to, um, here uh, just before actually I went on uh, mat leave. Um, so they were gonna do evening work on a weekday. And what we had is emergency phones only would be available at Oakville. So that's our sort of our kind of landline kind of phones that we have. Um, so no desk phones, no, um, hospital cell phone, things like that would work. Your normal Rogers personal phone, cell phones obviously would work. Um, also, and none of the computer systems would be up and running. Okay, so we're doing paper-based paper stuff at this point. Um, so we did activate an EOC, partially to be there just in case 
things went wrong or didn't come back on the way it was planned for it to come back on. Um, and as well, it also acted as a little bit of a call center. So little issues were being ported, then we could pass them on to the appropriate person who could go and deal with it. So here is our little structure for this. So our incident commander was our COO for Oakville Hospital. Um, as, and this was impacting our other sites, but the phone issue was only here at Oakville, just how the uh, work was happening. So she was the incident commander for it. Um, EOC scribe was there and it was a joint between senior project manager and emergency preparedness myself. I was the liaison officer. Um, as you can see, uh, the chief information officer who is sort of the head of our um, ICT department was ops, logistics and finance. Okay. We didn't think because of the event um, that it needed to divide it out, he was able to do all those roles. Um, you can also see that the planning section, we did bring in the leader on call for that night. Um, not that it was necessarily fully needed, but they also just wanted to come in as a learning opportunity. <laughs> so um, it was just another reason uh, we kind of let set it up for um, new staff to get some learning as well. Um, and then you can see under there, uh, the senior project manager also reported to them with a downtime procedure. So as things were coming up, um, the leader on call could support the departments with downtime. And then if you look under the operations section, you'll see once again that we have some teams that wouldn't normally report to the chief information officer, like the pharmacy labs and DIs, but they had validation teams set up in those groups um, that were reporting um, to him. So it worked really well. This was great, um, really helped us feel comfortable there was there, people were calling in if things were coming up, we were passing information on. Um, and then if it had gone the wrong direction, we were set up and ready to go uh, to move this into an actual emergency or incident command um, group as required. And that would have been uh, moving into what we call a code gray loss of ICT, and it would have been a loss of full network, and we would have announced that and moved to the next level. And that is all I've got. Okay, great timing. Um, so we did have actually a, a multi-part question come through. Um, and so I, I, I want to highlight so we can maybe pick at a few little pieces. But since you were discussing um, the incident with the contractor staff and the basement and Code Green stat, question came through that was around evacuation. So in the event of a fire, how do we evacuate patients? How do you move them to an alternate facility? How do you ensure they have you know, their medications or the gas that they need? So this is why I was saying, I know it's a, a really multifaceted question. I'm glad it got raised because it provides an opportunity to plug the next speaker in the series. <laughs> but we are focusing more on hospital evacuation. So stay tuned, all, the, uh, all our webinar participants, that that's the next topic we're focusing on. Um, but Cassandra, from your experience then, is there anything that you can comment on as far as if this had have progressed? Because clearly this wasn't in an actual patient um, area, what things would have been different um, and how Code Green perhaps looks like at, at Holton? Yeah, so it is, uh, unfortunately, it's one of those codes that we wish we could practice a lot more, but we don't get to do as much as we would like. Um, I'm hoping to do a little bit more coming up, uh, but we do uh, as you move and it depends on how it really depends on how fast you have to move people, which is going to sound funny, but it is a matter of, and especially in a fire, get them out. You break a leg, you break an arm, you fix that later. Person's going to die staying in the smoke. So it depends on, it depends on sort of what's going on and what, what the event is that's, uh, causing the evacuation. Um, so we have had to move patients for some some things, um, but when you do it, we it is a matter of we can move them on the stretchers or the beds, whatever. Sorry, I'm saying stretchers because the merge is right beside me. Um, so you could move them on the beds. It just depends. Um, if you have to go down the stairs, we do not have um, evac sleds or anything at Halton Healthcare, um, but they are uh, staff are taught and trained on how to get somebody down the stairs. And really, if you're going in a fast pace, you're just, you're going, you're protecting their head and you're getting them down. Um, and it sounds nitty and gritty, but unfortunately that's what you have to do sometimes. Um, 
but it is, we do have each department developed its own plan. So if they have what we call a, a block evacuation, so we're set up in blocks here at, all, at Oakville. So is it just their block that's impacted their area? Can they just move to from North Block to Center Block? How does that look? Where do they go? What do they do when they get there? Um, or do they have to actually leave the building? If they have to leave the building, where are we going? How are we setting this up? We do work with Halton Region to do a discharge center. So if we do have to do a total building um, evacuation, we do have it set up to move what we call our green patients that could be discharged somewhere. Um, they'll be discharged from there. Um, and then we work with the other hospital networks and uh, um, critical to move your other patients that cannot go home and they have to get to another hospital. Um, so there's sort of a network through the hospital systems that we do work with, uh, but uh, it will be great to hear the actual evacuation of a hospital coming up. Our exam, our real exam, um, we've really only evacuated when we moved, but it was a very coordinated uh, if you want to call it evacuated, very coordinated to move the patients up here. Um, and just the amount of level to do that as, uh, in that situation, it was uh, phenomenal and how quick it was done. Um, but yeah, it, there, there's no good answer. I'm happy to share plans um, or have a further discussion with someone, but we could talk about this for a long time, which is, um, which yes, <laughs> Misha's giving me the, uh, yeah, this is a huge topic and there's just so much involved to it. Um, but just so you guys do know, we do court color, um, here at Halton Healthcare, we do color code the patients if we have evacuations. And we do actually have wristbands that we'd apply of the different colors. And that just helps when you get to the next area, they uh, can quickly assess, okay, they're yellow, they're red, they're green, and, and know, okay, the green person can stay in the hallway a little bit longer. Let's get that red person in the room and get them what they need right away. So, okay, so hopefully that answered a bit of uh, the question that came through. Um, and again, lots of kind of um, facility or health network specific um, challenges. You have hospitals close by. I will raise that for um, the next session. You will hear about a hospital that doesn't have any other hospitals close by to be able to support. So lots of challenges. Again, this is a part of the reason why we wanted to get this series going. Um, but taking it back to IMS specifically, a little bit of kind of a practical logistical question was somebody was asking, do your EOC participants actually wear vests or, um, you know, some form of visible identification um, for folks that are kind of in emergency management general, you kind of get taught that with, with IMS, but obviously applying it to healthcare, just curious if that's something that's carried over. I was checking if I had one in the room, I don't. They wear lanyards. Um, and the lanyards match the colors of the IMS org chart. So the commands are all wearing green uh, lanyards and then it will say if they're EIO or safety officer or whatever, um, the ops people wear red. Um, we did the lanyards not the best just because, and it sounds funny, but um, people get hot in the vest as the stress level goes up. Um, so the lanyards were just more comfortable for people to wear uh, long-term sitting in the EOC. Um, they're easy to pass on to. So if someone steps out, they can pass on, uh, you know, they have to use the washroom or they have to go um, take a quick break or whatever, then they can pass on that lanyard very quickly to the person who's going to sit in their role while they're gone. Great. <clears throat> so I do have somebody then also asking a logistical question. So for anybody that's looking at the questions, I might not be reading them in order, but I will get to all of them. So somebody is commenting, you know, great presentation so far. So thank you. You're getting a little bit more kudos um, from the attendees, but wondering what forms and paperwork you use within your IMS framework. So sit reps and event boards and, you know, operational periods. Are there particulars that you've carried over or that you try to adhere to? Yes, so we do do operational cycles. Um, it is based on the event and what it requires and it is set by the incident commander. Um, so it could be 30 minutes, could be two hours. It just depends on what is needed. Um, we do do an incident action plan um, and we do use the provincial forms. So the provincial incident action plan form is what we use at Halton Healthcare. Um, we actually used it all through COVID for all our operation cycles. So they use the form. So some of them are very, very familiar now with that form, um, but it is used by our planning section. They are required to make an instant action plan for every operational cycle. 
um, and it is printed, signed off. Um, we do the full thing. We are looking at how we're going to digitize it all soon, um, as we do want to put a virtual EOC element into this. Um, but we do also have um, some of the other provincial forms that are relevant and work at a hospital. Um, obviously, we don't have sort of like the air the air form, you know, for the planes and things like that. None of that's at our hospital. Obviously, we don't have those. Um, we do use the EOC sign-ins. Um, so all the provinces forms that are relevant for us to use, we do actually have in our EOCs and are incorporated. Um, we actually also have EOC specific emails. So this got learned after our very first event. And the reason we did that was when the, when the groups transferred because the shift was, you know, from an eight hour shift to the next team, um, all the information was now lost because it was in their personal emails. So now when you come to the EOC, you sign in as the planning section chief and you email from the planning section chief's email address so that the next person who steps into the role hasn't lost all the information that was already um, done through that email. Uh, so that was sort of a lesson learned. Um, and we are looking at expanding that further as I talked. We do, um, uh, we already have teams at the hospitals. So we've been like exploring is that how, what we're going to start using uh, repository for all that information and all our job action sheets um, in these forms. They're online right now with our SharePoint, as well as hard copies printed and in totes in our EOC as well. Did I answer everything there, Misha? I think I think that was pretty good. Um, and I will also comment that's a really, really great point about the emails. I know some folks have um, kind of like electronic EOC software and they're able to sort of use that, but it depends on what tools you actually have in uh, available to you. And so something as simple as actually having dedicated emails so you don't lose that information on shift change is a great point to raise. Um, somebody was asking, so again, I'll be cognizant of time here. So we've got a couple more that were um, dropped into the Q&A. So have you ever received any reluctancy from leaders to participate in the EOC due to uncertainty with IMS? And if so, how have you managed that? We have, we have not here only because as they, so if we get a new senior leader starting, um, I am one of the first people that they do training with and they will learn right off the bat. We go in and we personally go through IMS and EOC structure with them. Um, and they're fine with that. I think they understand this is what's here. Um, we actually, I just actually did it with our brand new CEO. Uh, she just started uh, a week before I came back from leave. So I've sat down and I've explained, this is how we do IMS here. This is how our EOC is are structured. Um, so she understands what her role is and, um, and she was fine with it because it's here, it works. Um, so they don't want to obviously change that something that's already been working really well. Um, there was a little bit of under a little bit of probably fear almost at the beginning when we were going this route. Um, but that we kind of so we do have some from that changeover back then, and they've seen it working. And it sounds horrible, but just because we had so many issues when we opened our new buildings. We've had a lot of experience with the EOC. Um, so they've seen the ability of it and how it works and how it really does keep the right people in the room to do the decisions and keeps it to a small group that um, I think is what they really, really like about it. Um, so I haven't had quite the pushback. I know other groups have had. Um, and I know one of the big pushbacks is not is senior leaders. It is different for them not to be in the EOCs. Um, so that is a little bit unique and can be um, more awkward to do, as well as understanding that reporting structure of you're not reporting to your normal boss during the emergency. Um, once people kind of get their head wrapped around that, um, that's probably the sticky point. So you get more of the pushback. I've had less from my senior leaders as maybe from some of the other leaders. Um, and to get around that, we actually set up the EOCs and let them come in and see them. Or if they're one that maybe isn't quite sure about it, they're the ones that are going to be in my tabletops or my functional EOC exercises so that they can really work through it and see how this works. It's great, um, <clears throat> great detail on that question, because I think that's probably something we've all dealt with um, at a certain point or another. Obviously, as you mentioned, like organizational change, new staff, it's going to come up. Um, there is a question asking uh, how many of your EOCs are usually virtual? You made a comment about doing a bit of this transition, so that has come up also. 
we do prefer to be in the EOC physically and working with everybody. Virtual came up a little bit more with um, COVID uh, when it was as if that was sort of needed. Um, but we do want to get it ready for some of those responses that, you know, maybe we have a big ice storm and we can't even get into the hospital and the teams need to do some work. So we want to uh, really look at having that virtual as a sort of backup system, um, but we want to use it too as a tech, sort of the technology system. So this is how we might send messages, might pass information back and forth to each other during the event, as opposed to emailing. Um, so that's why I was just mentioning Teams has that kind of capability of uploading files, sharing files. So we could, uh, we could update the incident action plan right onto the uh, group and it's there, it's digitized. We're not printing it and signing it and trying to pass it around and email it to the whole group. And it would just uh, streamline a lot of things. So I, I don't know if virtual EOC, it would work as a virtual EOC, but also works as an EOC sort of repository as well, um, an incident tracking that we could use. Um, so we have not had to use it very much yet, um, but I think if the capability is there, it might be something that uh, would get used uh, further in the future. So I think that uses all of our um, Q&A uh, that have popped up. Um, again, there were a few more thank yous showing up um, discussing, you know, like it's a great presentation. They really appreciated. Um, again, your IMS uh, party overview, I think is probably something everybody's taking away um, as a fun little training piece going forward. Um, I really want to thank you for sharing your actual personal lived experiences. I know participants love to be able to hear um, how each other, you know, how we've coped um, with different types of incidents at different types of facilities or health organizations and giving a few different examples, including proactively getting that team together for a planned downtime um, is really great to see and is really encouraging um, to the rest of us to also try and get more of that proactive attitude out there. So I think that covers up my brief recap and I'll have closing remarks go um, back to our CFAL team. Yeah, and then just for the team, and please, you saw my email there, emergency preparedness at haltonhealthcare.com. Feel free to email me if you want any further information. I'm happy to set up a meeting if anything, uh, if we want to chat or if you just need some materials. Thank you so much. Thank you for that great presentation, Cassandra. Um, it was <clears throat> really informative and presented in like a really clear, straightforward way. So thank you so much. And thank you as well, Misha, um, for all your work on this series and for moderating the session. And thank you to everybody who came and watched and asked questions and participated. Um, um, I'm just going to very quickly share my screen to show the next session that we have. So as you all may know, our next session or our sessions for this series are the first Wednesday of every month. So the next session will be um, on Wednesday, August the 2nd, same time, 12 p.m. Eastern time um, with Amanda Kazmarek uh, speaking on the Red Lake Hospital evacuation. So as Misha mentioned earlier, this will be more focused on hospital evacuations um, and that specific topic. So for all of those interested, mark that on your calendar, share within your networks if you know anyone else who might find this topic interesting or the series in general interesting. Um, we have six sessions planned um, and may go a little further uh, if we get more speakers or if there is more interest. So thank you again.